Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for the second Sunday in Lent, which is this year, March 5th, 2023. And our uh, parable of the day is Matthew 20, uh, verses 1 through 16. So this is the familiar parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Uh, As we've talked about last week, uh, these Sundays in Lent, we'll be looking at many of these parables uh, in the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew has a lot of, excuse me, a lot of parables. So last week we talked about um, the parable of the unforgiving servant uh, and talked about the the need for forgiveness, the call to forgiveness and reconciliation. This parable now uh, uh, for, for this week, for the second Sunday in Lent, uh, continues on uh, a similar kind of theme in this uh, in this way uh, that the relationship uh, that is uh, broken here the 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 um, the tension in the story is between certainly between the landowner and the laborers in the vineyard but also between the laborers themselves uh, or at least that's the case for the laborers who are called out and work in the heat of the day, who who work throughout the day, and then are paid exactly the same wage as the laborers who have only worked for uh, an hour or so. And so they complain uh, to the landowner. Uh, this is verse 12. These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. The uh, the problem is that kind of envy uh, between the uh, the that that envy of of some of the laborers for the uh, against the others, uh, but it but it is also a tension between the laborers and uh, the landowner because uh, I think you brought up the the story of Jonah last week, Ralph, and that's I think a helpful anal- analogy here, right? We we like the kind of mercy, we like the kind of generosity. Uh, of God towards us, but when that generosity, when that grace is shown towards others, particularly those who we think don't deserve it, uh, well, then we complain, right? Uh, you're being too generous, God. As as uh, as Jonah says, you know, you are a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And it's not praise, it's an accusation <laughs> against God. So you can imagine these laborers uh, at the end of the story saying a similar thing. You are a God, you are a, a, the landowner, generous and gracious, uh, you know, slow to anger and abounding in generosity uh, and it's not a good thing it's a it's it's an accusation so uh yeah so what do we do with this um the landowner says uh friend i'm doing you no wrong you know you you agreed for this daily wage i gave it to you take what belongs to you am i not allowed to do what i choose with what belongs to me or are you envious because i am generous And then Jesus says, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Are you envious because I am generous? That's a really provocative question and I think one worth pondering for a while here. I really appreciate the uh, commentary this week and that focus which uh, draws the uh, attention to the landowner or in this with your question, Catherine, draws our attention to the character of God. Um, How frustrated we are, like Jonah, um, in God's grace, in God's generosity, in God's patience, in God's long suffering, in in God's willingness to forgive, uh, in God's willingness to, or or in God's continual concern um, for uh, the well-being of others. And um, so the the commentary uh, references this uh, as a focus on the laborer's need to work, and and that you know the the it's not profitable uh, to hire people like this. Um, it's not a bad judgment on the part of the landowner to not know how many people are going to be needed for work th- today. It's an act of generosity that says there's still people out there who long to work 
And I'm going to give them the opportunity, even if they only are going to work for one little hour. And I'm going to pay them a full day's wage. That is really frustrating for those of us who live in a society that is always looking for how do I get the best deal? How do I make the most money? What's in it for me? This this uh, this parable is just as uh, indicting for us in a capitalistic world as it was uh, for them in just the sense of the brokenness in community that is the context of how we've been reading these parables these last few weeks. I'm going to call attention to some things at the beginning of the parable that set up the end. And the first thing is just notice the kingdom of heaven is like. And so what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, it's where the will of God is break. My shorthand, it's where God's preferred future is breaking into the now. Mm-hmm. So what is, God, what is it like where God's will begins to uh, actually be enacted? It's like this story. And then in verse 2, I think it's a verse that um, m- most interpreters of this either miss or they don't highlight enough. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage. So the first group that worked all day, there was a handshake. Will you work with me for, I don't know, let's just say, Hundred bucks, hundred bucks a day. Um, they said, "Yep." And then you know he goes and and he hires more and more. But the, to the rest of them, he says, "I will pay you whatever is right." The word "right" here is dikaios. It's the same word which is righteous. It's the same. It's the verb justified that that you know becomes a big deal in Paul. So this has. This has implications for what is the righteousness of God? What does it look like when the righteousness of God is reflected in our lives? What does it look like when God makes us righteous or justifies us? All those echoes going on through that word. And then again, the same thing, that labor is throughout the day. So then in reverse order at the end of the day, people are paid and the people who have agreed to their salary, 100 bucks, see everybody in front of them getting 100 bucks and think, oh, we must be getting more than we've agreed to. And I think that bit sort of then really helps kind of flip the script on, on this because they get what they agreed to. Verse um, 10. Two stories. Uh, one is uh, John Ilvesacker, who was uh, – uh, he wrote over 10,000 songs. Uh, he was a Lutheran kind of Bob Dylan type, you know. And uh, – <laughs> You know, play the guitar in the '60s and um, really? and '70s and '80s and '90s, and but he's got a song. That's the thing I don't like about Jesus. Now I don't think he talks about this verse, but it's uh, this is a thing some people don't like about Jesus. Yeah. Again, uh, which I think kind of flips. You ask people, what is it you don't like about Jesus? Should we give the bigger donors more wine and better bread and first shot at communion? I mean. Should they get the better seats in the sanctuary? All the ways that we would liturgically enact this equality. Um, no, we don't have a we don't have a speed line for the, for the guests or the big donors, and we don't give them more, uh, you know, and, and the and the reward. A friend a friend of mine um, a, a friend of mine recently um, was part of what you never hear about anymore, which is a deathbed conversion and baptism. Mm-hmm. Mm. And uh, I was not there, but that's that's the part of the story that sometimes makes some lifelong Christians mad. Yeah. And I know somebody who there was one old lady at his church, could have been an old man, uh, who, when this story was the text, refused to come to church, mm. was angry mm. because didn't like the didn't like that deathbed kind of conversion interpretation of this story. And there's other ways to interpret it. Well, it's the uh, you know to to think about other parallels. It's the the older brother, right, in the prodigal right. son story, right. who's worked uh, with his father, who hasn't squandered the wealth uh, or the inheritance, who you know, but who hasn't gotten the party either, right, and uh, and and is angry at the father's generosity and the father's uh, willingness to forgive. Uh, I I would think that most of us who are you used the term professional Christians last week, Ralph. I think, uh, 
or for last week's reading, uh, those of us who are professional Christians or in in the teaching and preaching uh, role, I think uh, we're we're probably more like the older brother <laughs> or more like the, uh, uh, first the, the the first ones out into the vineyard, the 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 early morning laborers, uh, than we are like these latter ones. Uh, and you know, that might be a good question. Is to, are, uh, are you a six o'clock in the morning, Christian? Yeah. Are you a nine o'clock? Are you noon? Are you a three o'clock? Or are you, are you the 4.30? Are you 4.30? The and 4.30, Christian. I'm probably more like a noon person myself, <laughs> kind of halfway there, not the... Yeah. But the but the emphasis as you as you said join us our commentary commentary for this week talks about is on the landowner and the generosity of the landowner. So I think we acknowledge the uh, the human envy uh, that we've been talking about really the last couple of weeks, um, and we emphasize not that human sin, but we emphasize uh, God's grace, God's mercy for uh, for all sinners, including us. Uh, including us who may not have, uh, who may uh, be the six o'clock or the nine o'clock Christians, uh, to use your term, Rolf, but who are still uh, equally in need of God's mercy and grace and who still um, uh, give thanks for the Lord's uh, generosity towards us and towards our neighbor. To, to, to use another story in that, um, it's a story of Cain and, and Abel. And um, the story is of God's generosity to Cain, who's killed his brother. And yet God is going to put him in a permanent social security plan and make sure that, you know, everybody witness, the original witness protection 